Thank you so much for coming this evening, and I truly hope that you'll enjoy this evening's program. At this time, I'd like to introduce Connie Harris. Connie is, is generously sharing Jewish art, books, and personal objects which have fascinated and interested her throughout her lifetime. Her intent is to sustain Jewish heritage from generation to generation. And with tonight's Portrait of a People, a Jewish heritage exhibit, she hopes to inform us and connect us with the heritage of the Jewish people. Connie? I want to acknowledge my ability to put this thing together as a collector. And I've been asked to tell you a little bit about the collection itself and how it got here. I was very much interested in Jewish life and I started 20 years ago traveling with my husband. We went all over the place, all over the world. And he learned to say in every language, in every country where we were, do you have anything Jewish? And most places did because a lot of people were giving up the Jewish things they had either collected or stolen. And if you went into these little shops, they had things. And you'll see some of them here. Last month, I visited my sister, and she lives in Palm Desert, and she takes a class there at the University of California there, and one of the teachers asked me if I would speak about the book I had written, which was called The, uh, the Way Jews Lived, which had come out previously. And as I stood up there, fortunately here I've got a nice lectern which hides me, but there you could sort of see where I was, and the teacher said, well, just talk for two hours. <laughs> so I started talking, and as I'm talking, I suddenly felt a kind of slimy feeling going down my legs. And I looked down, and there were my black slacks down at my ankles. <laughs> the, the elastic gave way. <laughs> so I, I just bent down. And kept on talking. <laughs> These things happen in the best families. <laughs> but uh, and I, I, I want to talk to you about really about how I got the collection today. One of the places that we visited was a little sort of a, a junk store actually. And we walked in and said I said to the lady, do you have anything Jewish? And she said, yes. Uh, I have some six silver soup spoons. And she showed them to me. The European spoons are bigger than ours. And on the handle of the spoon, it said, engraved in Hebrew letters, Shabbat Shalom, a holy Sabbath. And I said to her, where did you get those? And she said, better you shouldn't ask me, you don't want to know. And that was the story in many of the places where we went. Some of the places that had materials wouldn't actually sell them. We went into a little bookstore and I didn't know where it was. I said to the man, do you have any Jewish books here? And he said, yes, there are some over there. And I picked up a couple. And I went to pay for it. And I noticed on the desk where he was taking the money, there was a, a menorah. And I said, what is that? He said, that's not for sale. I said, well, could you tell me what it is? He said, when I was about four years old, the Nazis came and took my parents from our apartment. And we had a next door neighbor who really didn't know my family, but she saw what was going on. And when the back was turned, she grabbed me and she grabbed the menorah and took them into her apartment. And she said, I grew up there. I have no idea what my name is. She said she didn't even know these people. 
She said, but she wanted me to know that I was Jewish. She wasn't. And she said, all my life, that's the only, that's the only thing I have is that menorah, and I keep it here, and I'm not selling it. I said, I don't want to buy it. But some of the things that we met with, some of the people we met with, it was just a very wonderful and a very difficult trip. We went to Poland, because my father's family came from Krakow. And Krakow is right near Auschwitz, and I didn't want to go there. But I said, can I grow up? So we went there, and when you walk into the place, it's, it was originally an army barracks. So you just see some brick buildings and some grass. I will not try to describe what's inside, because for those of you who've seen it, you don't need any description. For those of you who have not seen it, you won't believe it. <coughs> but as we walked out, there is a gravel walk where you, people who were interned there walked that gravel road, that path. And as we were leaving, I bent down and I picked up a few of the pebbles. You could still see the pathway was kind of gray because the ashes are still there. When it rains, the ashes are tapped down. When it dries, they become powdery. And I picked up a couple of pebbles and I brushed them off very carefully and I put it in my pocket. And when I had the exhibition originally at the Ann Arbor in Michigan, I included that as one of the things that I donated. It had no value, it had no monetary <coughs> interest, but it was tremendously precious to me. And that pebble sits there in Ann Arbor to today. I gave the collection to Ann Arbor about five years ago. I had collected all of this stuff and it was in my house. I had two or three thousand items. And they were under the bed and in the closets and took out the dishes and put them where the dishes were. I had no place for them. I have a small house. So my son lives in Michigan. That's why I chose that place. And I called them cold. I spoke to their Librarian. Michigan has 18 libraries, an Asian library, a Chinese, all kinds of libraries. And they have a special collections library. And I told him what I had, and he said he was going to be in LA pretty soon. Could he see it? He came out, and he said he would spend two hours with me. After eight hours, we had gone through about a third of the stuff. And there were many books and many. Chachkas. Chachka is something that sits on a table and needs dusting. <laughs> so he said to me, you know, he said, we're a library. We go into books. He said, but you have a collection that is so unique that I'm going to take the whole thing if you want to give it to us. And so that's where it sits today. It has maybe 3,000 gifts that we gave. And they've been marvelous about lending it out to places like Chapman. And Scott went there and picked out the items that he chose and wanted. I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> I trusted him. And Esra was just marvelous, as I said, about organizing all of this. It's a great privilege for me to stand here and talk to you because it's a collection that I love and it's a university which I feel very close to now. But I'm not through yet. I feel there are too many books that I haven't read. There are too many places I haven't been to. There are too many friends 
that I haven't had time to see or spend time with. There are too many ideas and memories that I haven't been able to keep long enough. But I'm grateful and I'm thankful that you let me stand here and tell you about it. For me, for me it's been a grand journey. Thank you. And so this particular exhibit that celebrates Jewish life for my niece and for many of the Jewish students is one of the reasons that they feel at home here. They're looking for an experience of diversity. They're looking for quality teachers. And at the same time, they want to be in a place where their own distinctive traditions are embraced. I did have an opportunity yesterday to look briefly at the exhibit. And what I wanted to focus in on in the 18 minutes that I'll be speaking a good Jewish number, right? 18, where every number is identified with a letter, it means chai, which means life. And Jews and Judaism are focused on celebrating life. Numbers are a symbol, so chai is a symbol. The objects, likewise, are symbols too. Most of the objects that we own in our own homes are souvenirs. I know that's clearly true for the art that we have on our walls and our tchotchkes that we have getting dusty on our shelves. <laughs> that they're largely reminders of where we have been and who we've been with. Sometimes they have an extrinsic value. When we were in a wonderful place, we might have splurged and spent a little bit more on a artwork or on a piece of jewelry. But more than the intrinsic value for most of us of our objects, even our most beautiful objects, it's what they signify to us. And so is the nature of the objects that I saw on display. Most of them are not particularly valuable for their materials. They're made from brass, or paper, silver plated, but they are of extraordinary significance to the people that own them, to us who witness them, and more. Hopefully, and that's what I hope to do in my little remaining time, is talk about why rituals are made more whole, more profound, more beautiful because of the objects that we use. There's a story of a man who comes to his rabbi. So Rabbi says, I haven't seen you in synagogue very much. He operates on a level of guilt that I tend to not do. <laughs> so he says to the man, I see, I haven't seen, you in, I haven't seen you for quite a while. The man says, you know, if God is everywhere, why do I need to go to synagogue to pray? To which the rabbi says, although God is the same everywhere, you aren't. And when you come to a place that's dedicated to worship, and you're surrounded by other people engaged in prayer, you're different. Likewise, our objects are transforming for us. The stories that we're now reading in the Bible, in the current cycle of the annual readings of the five books of Moses, are focused almost entirely on ritual objects. It's the readings that are remarkably boring of the building of the tabernacle. They're boring because there is the minutia of description of the nuts and the bolts, literally, of the crafting of this portable tabernacle. The people stood at Mount Sinai, so the Bible records, and had the most profound of experiences. There, as a community standing shoulder to shoulder, they witnessed and heard the presence of God. In terms of a self-identity, it's a unique kind of moment. If the people encountered God at Mount Sinai, how could they go anywhere else? This was the epiphany. This was the height of closeness to the divine. 
And so in that moment, before they left, God said, build for me a portable sanctuary, a mishkan, v'shachanti betocham, and I will dwell among you. And the rabbis emphasize, it does not say in the Bible that God says, I will dwell in it, as if a vessel could contain the infinite. But rather through your efforts of crafting this meticulously described <clears throat> ritual object, in the effort of community coming together and contributing and crafting something that's beautiful, I will dwell among you. You will have become a community by your efforts. And it was beautiful, the Mishkan. It had at the inner sanctuary, perfectly square, 10 cubits by 10 cubits, that holy ark, like, like in the Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> but that particular ark was made fully from gold and it had two angel figures facing each other with wings, with intricate carvings around the edges, so that when it was seen, it was extraordinarily beautiful. But this is something interesting to note. I say when it was seen, that particular object was kept in the dark. There was no light in that room. More. The only one who went into that room was the high priest, and he, he only went in once a year on Yom Kippur to ask for the people's forgiveness. Contained within that vessel was the tablets of the Ten Commandments. So heightened an experience, so filled with awe and trembling for the high priest to enter into that spa sacred space that he literally, according to the rabbis, had a string around his ankle in case he died, they could pull him out because nobody else was allowed in. There was a lot, lot, lot more to say about the tabernacle, but it's a starting point to say that religious observance engages a full person. And we who are physical need physical objects to engage our imagination. For ultimately, a ritual act is an induction. It's kind of hypnosis. It's an act of imagination to find oneself in prayer, to find oneself in memory, to find oneself in community requires imagination for a moment to become more than just a moment. This is the most common Jewish book found in American Jewish life. 80, 80, wait, 50, don't exaggerate. 50 million copies have been printed over the last 80 years. This year, 2012, is the 80th anniversary of the Maxwell Haggadah, its origins. Maxwell, 80 years ago, had gotten kosher certification. It was a Jewish family. And they wanted at Passover seders to compete, mind you, mostly immigrants drinking tea, putting that sugar cube you know, between their teeth and sipping the tea. Maxwell thought, when the family sit around the seder table, we're going to sell them coffee. We're kosher. And so they said, what we're going to do is, if anybody buys our coffee, we'll give them a free Haggadah. And in the display that Connie has provided, this is a more contemporary Haggadah from Maxwell House. There is an earlier version. And this last year, Maxwell came out with a brand new version. This is the Haggadah that President Obama used last year at the White House. In surveys of the American Jewish community, 70 plus percent of American Jews, no, closer to 90 percent of American Jews, participate in a Seder, the gathering around the table to tell the story of the going out from Egypt. Haggadah means a telling. For most Jews, traditionally, the Seder was a formal meal the best china, the finest crystals. Because to celebrate freedom, it was not only about 
slavery, it was also about freedom, the decor mattered. Aesthetics mattered. How we dress and how we eat off a table says a lot about the significance of a moment and engages our imagination. It's a statement of celebration. And so the finest china and silver that people have that they hardly use all year, hardly use all year traditionally because you need separate dishes for Passover because of the dietary restrictions of the holiday where you can't eat leavened products and your plates can't even have been used for leavened products. So there's enormous investment aesthetically. But yet, at the center of that gathering with all the symbolic foods and the telling of the tale, which again engage the imagination to ingest the story as well as to tell it, is Haggadah, which literally means the telling. So to prepare us for the upcoming Seder, know that the rules for the Seder already begin to appear in the third century in what's called the Mishnah. In the Torah itself, in the five books of Moses, there's very little bit said about this major event of families telling the tale. There is, in chapter 12 of Exodus, the description of the Hebrews on the eve before the 10th plague getting ready to leave, gathered with family and friends because they had to consume an entire lamb together. So people gathered. They put the blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would know that this was a safe house. And when we gather in our own homes, we recreate that event. But we tell not only of slavery, we also tell of freedom, and hence the telling. Haggadah means telling. The first Haggadah that appears is not until the 7th or 8th century. That's part of a prayer book published in Baghdad. Baghdad was the center of Jewish life, one of the major capitals of the world in the 7th, 8th, and the earlier centuries. And there, Rav Amram Gaon, when asked by the Jews of Spain what the Jewish prayer should look like, composed a prayer book, a siddur, that included a Haggadah. Later, it became a separate text, and throughout the Middle Ages became the most commonly illuminated Jewish book, because the Seder was a day of such significance of families gathering together. And this is before the printing press. It wasn't like Maxwell House, where everybody has a book and you go around the table taking turns reading. In those days, the head of the house, if he had money, commissioned a manuscript that was illustrated. This is one from Sarajevo, former Yugoslavia that was sold by an 11-year-old orphan in 1894. Family was bereft of funds. It had been in his family for generations. Scholars say this dates to the year 1350 of northern Spain. But throughout the Middle Ages, for Jews, the most commonly illuminated text was the Haggadah. The first Haggadah that was ever printed was printed in Guadalajara, Spain in 1482, 10 years before the expulsion of the Jews. And since 1482 to our own day, I guess there's a number that's around there in terms of 630 years or something, um, there are thousands of Haggadot. This is a new Haggadah by my friends who live in Israel, um, using kind of cartoon-like illustrations, weaving in recent moments of Jewish history, like the Soviet jury campaign, with a poster of Let My People Go. Regarding Passover, the time in which families gather together, aesthetics enable a sense of importance. Aesthetics allow nostalgia, using a kiddush cup that belonged to a parent or from one's bar mitzvah or from a grandparent or reclaimed from Eastern Europe. 
makes that event a true connection generation to generation. But more, the goal of this telling is a line in it. In every generation, a person is to see him or herself as if he or she went out from Egypt. That quality of imagination, to see this telling as one's own and oneself as having been somewhere else and simultaneously present, is the challenge of all ritual. Ritual is the act of transformation in which a person sees beyond him or herself and links oneself both to community and to that which is divine, transcendent. Aesthetics, the ritual objects on display, are each part of a larger fabric, a collage of creating lives of transcendence. And one closing comment. When I looked at the uh, objects and I understood I couldn't take them out to do show and tell, there was an object that I had received years ago as a gift. And it's this, which is an Omer counter. And it was given to me by a rabbi's family as a gift. And it said 1950 Israel. I knew it was Israel from the olive wood. But I didn't know it was 1950, which means at the start of the state of Israel. It's a box with numbers written on parchment, as on a Torah scroll. It's the counting of the 49 days from Passover to the holiday of Shavuot, the holiday of the Haggadah, of liberation, to the holiday of the receiving of Torah at Mount Sinai. Seven times seven. Seven is the number of wholeness. 49 days of preparation so that traditionally on the 50th day, the people would have been prepared to encounter God's presence and to enter into relationship with God. This, too, is a helpful aid. I now, get, uh, I now have an app on my phone that does the same for me. But through the generations, this was a, both a tool, but also a reminder of importance that that counting was of significance, a sign and a symbol as embodied in a beautiful ritual object. May those beautiful ritual objects allow the students of Chapman to have curiosity about Judaism. May the Jewish students be known that they are at home. And may each of us, who are in many cases in this room, their elders, find a sense of not only honoring the Jewish faith, but honoring the diversity of faiths and traditions knowing that in each case, it's a full person represented as the holder of those objects. Thank you. My um, short talk up here is entitled Women, Past and Present, an Exploration of Jewish Life. And when I was asked to look at the collection and discuss something about the collection, my own scholarship in the work of women in religion and gender studies really came into focus. So my scholarship, as mentioned before, takes me into the past, the distant past, into the biblical world of ancient Israel and even beyond before that, um, studying the people and the practices which eventually became the Jewish religion, the Jewish faith. Um, a particular part of my interest lies in women. Um, what were the roles of women? What were their religious roles? What did they do? And this, of course, takes us into the home. So what strikes me as extraordinary about this collection is the fact that a ritual practice or an ancient Hebrew text from, let's say, approximately 1,000 BCE still lends itself to a practice or a ritual or belief that we do today um, in modern Judaism, that it still resonates throughout time. So we have over 3,000 years of continuity and tradition uh, with some of these objects. So my talk will try to connect some of the objects um, from the past to the present through the common denominator of women. OK, so we have to start in the beginning, um, back to the Torah. And when you look at the Torah, looking on the surface, the official religious and ritual practices of women 
in ancient Israel, you see a striking absence. You know, putting aside any nida, purity laws, um, or notions of cleanliness or uncleanliness, the women's roles in the Bible are very restricted to three main areas, song, dance, and mourning. Okay, so I could quote biblical passages, but basically they would sing songs of worship. Um, they would sing songs of victory when the men came back victorious in war. They would dance, and they would also be the ones who were professional mourners and also prepared the bodies. So other than these three main roles, we don't see much in the Bible what they do. For instance, they had no prominent role in the ancient temple. Obviously, they could not be priests. Um, they were not required to go to Jerusalem for the three annual pilgrim festivals. They went by default as part of the family unit. Well, so did slaves and property. Um, so they were par default part of that. And of course, they could not enter into the covenants because they were women. They couldn't get circumcised. So it looks kind of bleak on the surface if you just look at the text. But my own research takes me into the material culture, into the objects, into the archaeology. And that is where I think we can uncover this rich world of women in antiquity. So in this domestic realm um, is where we're going to start. Now let me think about some of the objects. One of the objects in particular was a doll. A doll of a woman who is lighting the Shabbat candles. This woman is dressed in traditional clothing. Makes me think about Shabbat. Um, today, one of the major symbols of female religious identity in Judaism, and one of the three mitzvot for women, is the candle lighting on the Shabbat. Um, and the rest of the Shabbat is also filled with feminine imagery. So our exhibit, in addition to that doll, has other um, examples um, that are of ritual objects that are used on the Shabbat. So let me talk a minute about the Shabbat. One of the things about the dolls, and one of the things about we, we do today, we light two candles on the Shabbat. Why two candles? The two candles represent the two places in the Torah, um, the text in Exodus and the text in Deuteronomy that specifies that you will honor and observe or remember and observe the Shabbat. So the two candles stand for those two ideas, the idea of remembering and the idea of observing the Shabbat. The Shabbat candles are traditionally lit by women. So we have women ushering in the holy day, ushering in um, the sacred, uh, sacred day of Shabbat. Um, why do we keep the Shabbat? Well, according to the biblical text, we have it in the two places in the Ten Commandments, but also back to Genesis. On the seventh day, God rested. So therefore, we rest also on the seventh day, and we honor God. Um, so in biblical times, we don't know too much about how they observe the Shabbat um, in biblical times. When the temple was around prior to 70 CE, the um, Shabbat services were focused in the temple. With the destruction of the temple, Shabbat and many other of the religious holidays became more home-centered, more focused in the family. With this focus in the family, women became able to play a stronger role. They wouldn't use candles, obviously, in biblical times, but they used oil lamps. And one of a woman's responsibilities in ancient Israel was to maintain the wicks and take care of the oil for these lamps. So again, the women were taking care um, of this very, very sacred act. Another thing women were in charge of, uh, sticking with the Shabbat, obviously cooking. Um, one of the rites that women used to practice, and I don't, it's practiced very rarely today, is what's called the hala um, separation rite. What women, traditionally married women, baking their bread, used to separate a piece of the bread out and burn it. This would symbolize what it says in Numbers 15, that we are commanded to set aside a portion, a portion of the hala dough um, for tithing, for the temple priest. So this was another prominent role that women would do in antiquity. Now, just as the ritual of Shabbat begins with candle lighting, 
We also end the Shabbat with a ritual. Um, it ends with a concluding prayer and the Havdalah <coughs> ritual. Havdalah literally means separation. Females also play a role in this domestic ritual. The Havdalah candle is usually held by a girl or a young woman. Um, they also will use other ritual objects. The Kiddush cup, which could be used for Shabbat, also for the Havdalah, would be brimming with wine. And they would use two, uh, spice boxes. The display has, I think there's two, maybe there's three, um, spice boxes. The spice boxes are filled with fragrant spices, cloves, allspice, uh, cinnamon. A blessing is said over the spices, and then it will be passed around for people um, to smell the wonderful spices. And the rabbinic uh, legend of why we use these spices and why we pass them around is there was an idea that when we are in Shabbat time, um, we have a special Shabbat soul. And this Shabbat soul would leave when Shabbat is over. And in order to perk us up, so to speak, um, and prepare us for the next week, we will smell these fragrant herbs to take us in to the next Shabbat. Um, so that's one of the legends. Also, with Havdalah, the separation ritual at the end of Shabbat, um, we will drink wine from a Kiddush cup. Um, traditionally, and in many Orthodox families, the women would not drink the wine from this cup. And the reason why women wouldn't do it is there's an ancient legend that if women drink out of this cup, they'll grow a beard. So I'm sure that's, you know, if some of you want to think about what's happening to you, that might be why. Um, another part of the tradition, and this is always one of my pet peeves with um, some of the interpretation, another part of the tradition saying why the women shouldn't drink out of the Kiddush cup is they take it back to Eve. It's always Eve's fault um, when something goes wrong. It's Eve's fault. But because Eve picked from the tree of knowledge, which according to some rabbinic idea, was grapes, and grapes grew the, the wine, so therefore women won't drink out of that. Um, anyway, Havdalah marks the end of the Shabbat. We take ourselves from sacred time and we move back into profane time. And the ritual objects, um, the spice boxes, and the Kiddush cup, and the Havdalah candles help us visualize that. Um, about the Shabbat, I said there was a lot of feminine imagery. In post-biblical times, and up until today, the Shabbat is recognized as a queen, or more commonly, as a bride. Um, a Midrashic commentary says that when God created the world, the days of the week, every day had a mate. Sunday was with Monday, Tuesday with Wednesday, Thursday with Friday, but we have Saturday all by itself. Saturday, therefore, was given as a bride to all of the people of Israel. Hence the bridal imagery. Um, in late antiquity, uh, uh, when the Talmud was beginning, so let's say 200, 300 CE, the rabbis um, would dress in white clothing, garments, as a, and walk around as a bridegroom to welcome in the Shabbat, walk along the hills claiming, come my beloved, let us greet the Shabbat bride. Laka Dodi, um, this Come My Beloved is sung or chanted on, fr on Friday night services, Shabbat today. During the Middle Ages, and we have the development of Jewish mysticism, the idea of the theme of the Shabbat developed even more into the feminine presence of God, and the Shabbat was therefore thought of as the day of a mystical union between God and the people and considered on that day a mitzvah, a commandment for a husband and wife to be intimate with one another, to be fruitful and multiply, as symbolic of the union between God and the Jewish people. So it's that, with that idea of marriage, mystical marriage, I move into marriage. And I think of some of the other objects in the display. Um, we have a ketubah, a marriage contract. Um, the exhibit, I think it's a 1926 ketubah, as well as um, an engagement contract. There is an 1840 ink drawing of a Jewish newlywed couple, a 1786 engraving um, from London of a girl dressed for her marriage ceremony, um, and uh, 
painting of a couple under the wedding canopy, under the hoopa. So ketubah, what's a ketubah? It comes from the Jewish word katav, uh, the root word, which literally means to write. Um, and originally, and, and today I guess it still functions in that way, it outlines the rights and the responsibilities of the groom in relation to the bride. And its origins stem from very early times, 300, um, B 300 CE. The ketubah was designed to protect the woman, to protect the wife, because in those times, the husband had the full right to divorce the wife unilaterally for whatever reason. I don't like you, you burnt my dinner, you're divorced. Um, and this ketubah idea was actually to protect the women, as it spells out the husband must provide a settlement for her. If he divorces her, uh, there's a stipulation. If he dies, what is to happen? So it's an important element um, looking at women in Jewish life. Today, at a traditional Jewish wedding, um, the ketubah is signed by two witnesses. It's read during the ceremony under the hoopah, um, and it's given to the bride. Many couples then have elaborately um, decorated um, uh, ketubah, and they display them in their homes. OK, so another holiday that I want to end with. Um, and this holiday would not even exist if it wasn't for one brave biblical woman. This is the holiday of Purim. We just celebrated it last week. Um, Purim is one of the ha happiest, most joyful, some would say drunken, um, <laughs> holidays in the Jewish calendar. It celebrates the victory of the Jews over Persia. The holiday is based on the biblical scroll of Esther, and it's a tale of court intrigue. Um, this young teenager, this young Jewish teenager, Hadassah, was residing in a foreign land, Persia, during the fourth century BCE. The Jewish people then, a powerless and marginalized minority, are in exile under the reign of a mighty Persian empire. Well, the Persian king goes on a hunt for a new queen. Hadassah, now called Esther, at the urging of her guardian Mordecai to hide her Jewish identity, joins the king's harem and becomes his new queen. Mordecai cautions Esther to keep her Jewish identity secret. She does so, <coughs> up until a point when she finds out a plan by the evil Haman to execute all the Jews. At great peril to herself, her own life, she asked for an audience before the king. That was not done in those days, even though he was her husband, but he had a lot of wives, so she, he, they didn't do that. <laughs> so she approaches the king, though, with a twist of the text, she does not immediately tell the king of Haman's evil plan. No, what she does is brilliant. She uses the tools and the powers that are available to women in ancient times to win him over, her beauty and her food. The texts tell us she invites him to her quarters for a banquet. Um, so the old adage, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, that probably comes from the book of Esther. Um, <laughs> it's as old as this. Anyway, she invites the king to this series of dinner parties. The king is now in her control, and the evil plan is revealed, and she saves the Jewish people um, from extermination. Every year on Purim, the book of Esther is read. Women as well as men are specifically commanded to listen to this public reading. Even in most um, Orthodox communities and in other places where women are not required to listen to the public reading of the text, there is a specific specification that says, women and children, you must listen to this. And every time the name of Haman, the villain, is read, we are to make noise to erase his name. Traditional noisemakers, groggers, are used. The collection has some beautiful groggers, including a wonderful ivory one. That's just a beautiful collection. Um, so the grogger is a special part of Purim and a special part of Jewish tradition. Everyone participates. And the name Haman is spoken 50, at least 50 times in the text. 
So you can imagine the revelry, um, making noise and screaming and yelling. Now, in antiquity, the custom was to make a likeness of Haman and to destroy that likeness. That custom fell out of favor, and then another custom started. And this was to write Haman's name on the bottom of your shoes and then to wipe it against the synagogue floor or the sidewalk, to literally erase his name. From this custom of wiping your feet on the floor is where we got the custom of stamping our feet in the synagogue. And so we still do that. We still stamp our feet, as well as um, making the noise. Um, so if it wasn't for Esther, this one biblical brave woman, this would not even happen. And the last thing I want to mention um, about women's roles in the home and the connection to modern day uh, Judaism and to our exhibit brings me to my favorite object. And I tried to research on the internet, and I googled everything I could to find more about this object, and I couldn't. This is the 1950s era, and I'm guessing at the date. <coughs> electronic quiz game that's in the collection. Um, it's an electronic quiz game called Let There Be Light. In the 50s, these games were used to teach history, geography, um, other educational subjects. So this is the precursor to Words with Friends, I guess, um, or, in, or any of these games, this electronic game. Advertised as a quiz show in a box, these games were mostly multiple choice and matching games. And drawing upon the latest technology, they had little tiny light bulbs in them. And these light bulbs would lit, light up when you would have the right answer. Um, this particular game completely fascinates me. I actually want to play it if I could. Um, because from that game, people would learn about Judaism. Um, they would learn about the holidays. Let there be light. Obviously, they would learn about the Torah, the Bible. And in biblical times, the woman was responsible for schooling. When boys got older, they went off and they did formal study of Torah and Talmud. But in the home, the woman, in addition to the other tasks, would be the ones to tell the children the stories of the tradition and through informal means. So just like that toy, the Let There Be Light toy, which I could see a family in you know, the Leave It to Beaver 50s, um, a Jewish family, of course, <laughs> playing this game um, and learning about the Torah learning about their tradition through informal education. So through these objects and through ancient objects, the story of the Jewish people um, comes alive. Thank you.